GW190521 is a huge discovery. It has a gravitational wave signal from the coalescence of two black holes to form one about 140 solar masses. That is the largest black hole we have yet discovered with gravitational waves. It is the first definitive discovery of an intermediate mass black hole. It is also a puzzle, as it is a mystery how its source could form. Anything can become a black hole if it is squeezed enough you just need to pack enough stuff into a small space, just like when you're taking a Ryanair flight. In practice, most stuff is stiff enough to push back against squeezing to avoid becoming a black hole. It's only when you get the core of a star about somewhere between 2.1 solar masses and 3 solar masses that gravity becomes strong enough to collapse things down to a black hole. Above this threshold, can we have a black hole of any size? The biggest black holes are found in the centers of galaxies. These can be hundreds of thousands to ten of billions the mass of our sun. Our own Milky Way has a rather moderate four times ten to the power of six solar masses black hole. These massive black holes are far bigger than any star, even Elvis. They therefore couldn't have formed from a collapsing star. So how did they form? The truth is, we're not sure. It's possible that we started with smaller black holes and fed them up, or merged them together, or a mixture of both. These initial seed black holes could have formed from stars, or possibly giant clouds of collapsing gas, which may form 10,000 solar masses black holes. In any case, whatever mechanism created these black holes needs to work quickly, as we know from that there are massive black holes by the time the universe is a mere billion years old. To figure out how massive black holes form, we need to discover their seeds. Between stellar mass black holes and massive black holes should lie intermediate mass black holes. These are typically defined as having masses between 100 solar masses and 100,000 solar masses. Massive black holes should grow from these smaller black holes. However, we never have found one. They are the missing link in the black hole spectrum. There are candidates though, ultra-bright X-ray sources or globular clusters with suspiciously moving stars. But none of these is rock solid and couldn't be explained another way. GW190521 changes this at 142 plus or minus 28 over 16 solar masses. The merger remnant is without a doubt an intermediate class black hole. This discovery shows that intermediate mass black holes can form from mergers of smaller black holes. However, this doesn't yet solve the mystery of how massive black holes are grown. We need observations of larger intermediate mass black holes for that. We'll keep searching. What I find more exciting about GW190521 are the masses of the two black holes that merge. Our analysis gives this as 85 plus or minus 21 over 14 solar masses and 66 plus or minus 17 over 18 solar masses. The large black hole masses are extremely difficult to explain. When you form a black hole from a star, its mass depends upon the mass of its parent star. More massive stars generally form bigger black holes, but because of all the physics that goes on inside stars, it's not a simple relationship. One important phenomena is determining the fate of massive stars is pair instability. When the cores of stars become very hot, of to about 3 times 10 to the power of 9 Kelvin, just as slightly the temperature of a mozzarella on that first bite of pizza, the photons of light or gamma rays bouncing around inside the core become energetic enough to produce pairs of electrons or and positrons. For the star, this causes some trouble. Its core is mostly supported by radiation pressure. If photons start disappearing as they are converted to electrons and positrons, then there isn't much radiation around and the star will start to collapse. As it collapses, explosive nuclear reactions are triggered. Pair instability kicks in for stars with helium cores about 30 solar masses. If the core is between 30 solar masses and about 65 solar masses, the star will blast off its outer layers, possibly repeating the cycle of pair instability collapse and explosion many times. 
This results in smaller black holes than you might otherwise expect. For helium cores between 65 uh, solar masses and about 135 solar masses, the explosion completely distorts the star, leaving nothing behind. These stars never collapse down to a black hole, and this leaves a gap, predicted to start somewhere 45 solar masses and 55 solar masses. GW190521 was first identified in online searches about 20 seconds after they took the data. All three of our detectors were online and observing at the time. It was a short bleep of a signal indicating a high-mass system. Short signals always makes me suspicious as they can easily be confused with some types of glitch. The signal was picked up by multiple search algorithms, which generally is a good sign as they all estimate the background of the noise in a slightly different way. However, the estimated false alarm rates were only one per few years. That's not terribly impressive. It's the range where things can change as we collect more data. Immediately, checks of the signal began. We have many ways of monitoring detectors, and experts started running through these. Microphones at Hanford picked up a helicopter overhead a few minutes later, but that's too far away in time to be related to the signal. The initial checks all looked okay, so we're confident that it was safe to share the candidate detection as 190521G. First, the peak of the signal is around 60 Hz. This is also the main frequency in the U.S. So there was a concern that the signal was contaminated by noise caused by this, which would obviously be shocking. A variety of careful investigations were done subtracting out the noise from the mains. In the end, it turns out that this makes negligible difference to the results, which is nice. Second, there was a concern over the shape of the signal. Our template-based search algorithms always look at how well the signal matches the template. If you get a really good match in one frequency range but not another, then that's an indicator that you have some random noise rather than a true signal. This consistency test is summarized in a statistic, which should be around 1 if all is okay and larger if things don't fit. For the PYCBC algorithm, the value for the Livingston data was about 3. Since the signal was loudest in Livingston, was this cause for an alarm? One explanation could be that the template wasn't a good fit because the templates used by the search don't include the effects of spin precession. Hence, if you have a signal where spin precession is important, you would expect a bad fit. Checking the consistency with templates, which included precession, did give better consistency. However, the GSTLAL algorithm also used templates without precession, and its consistency test looked fine. Therefore, it couldn't be just precession. It seems that the key is that there are so few templates in the relevant area for PYCBC's template bank. GSTLAL had things better covered. Hence, it is hard to find a good fitting template. Adding the best fitting template from the GSTLAL bank to the PYCBC search leads to it being picked out as the best template too, with a consistency check statistic of 1.7. Not perfect, but not suspicious. I think this highlights the importance of not limiting yourself to only finding what you expect. We need to include the potential for our searches to discover things outside of what we have discovered in the past. The observing team estimate that the probability of a chance association is small. However, there is a lot of uncertainty in how active galactic nuclei can flare. The good news is that the remnant black hole may continue to orbit and hit the disk again, leading to another flare. The bad news is that the uncertainty on when this happens is many years, so we don't know when to look. Follow-up analysis by Ashton and others in 2020 and Palmis and others in 2021 cast the association as more uncertain. It is difficult to be confident of an association when the localization volume is so large. If we knew that this type of flare had to look exactly like the observed emission, that would help. 
but we can't be certain just yet. In this case, they hypothesize that the binary had some gas orbiting around it. And when the binary merged, the gravitational wave recoil kick sent the remnant black hole on its orbiting material into the disk of the supermassive black hole. As the orbiting material crashes into the disk, it will emit light. Then, once it is blasted away, material from the disk accreting onto the remnant black hole will also emit light. This seems to fit with what was observed, with the later powering the observed emission. Overall, we need to observe another similar association before we can be certain of what's going on. I really hope this candidate counterpart encourages people to follow up more binary black holes to look for emission. The unexpected discoveries are often the most rewarding.